Amen. The cross gives you the escape from what I'm going to preach about this morning. Amen. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. And uh, while you're turning there, uh, with turn there in your Bible with one hand and the other hand, raise that hand if when you were growing up, your mom and dad whipped you with a belt, their hand, a rod, a switch, any such item, or anything within reach. I remember our mama come out after me and my sister with a broom. Show enough. She was sweeping us with the besom of destruction. <clears throat> That's in your Bible, by the way. If you don't know what a besom is, it's a broom. It says it in that verse. God said, I will sweep them with the besom of destruction. She did. She got, she got mad. We wasn't doing what we were supposed to be doing. And I didn't know what we were supposed to be doing. But we was on the back porch and she come out after us with broom. That's what she had in her hand. And she just went to brooming us with the soft, the broom part. Not the handle part, the broom part. But I grew up in the 70s when they made those real wide leather belts. You remember those? And that wasn't torture enough. They put brass rivets in them. Remember those? Oh, yeah. And since my mom didn't have one, when I got in trouble, it was always, give me your belt. Four words. The most dreaded words I remember hearing. Give me your belt. My mom did not abuse me. Nope. She did not harm me and scar me for life. She saved me. That's what she did. Fact of the matter is, I don't think she whipped me enough. Amen. That was not your amen, sister. That was not your amen. Unless you mean that in a personal way, that your mother did not whip us enough in general. Is that how you meant that? That's, that's how I thought you meant it. Because I still have a list of stuff that I haven't told mom yet on you. Oh, never mind. Because she's got a list too. There's a reason why I'm bringing this up. Let me tell you something. And I'm going I'm to say it in love. And I love you. I love you online. I know it's not popular. But we have seen in our nation... What psychology has done in raising children in this country. The psychologists, and I'm not necessarily against psychology and psychologists as long as they truly understand who is it that made the psychology of children. God did that. And God put it in the heart and the mind of children. That they don't feel safe until they know where the barriers are. Rules and guidelines are the barriers. And something that has I've been seeing all week long. And I, I did not ask any of the farmers we were around. We were up in Amish country up in Illinois. And if you ever want to go there, I can tell you where all the good restaurants are and where all the good shops are. I mean, I can fill you in. But... We notice that they're, of course, they raise a lot of horses, and uh, you can see the difference in them. Some of them are those great big meaty plow horses, and some are those they raise those trotting horses that carry their buggies around. But every Amish farm up there has an electric fence. What's an electric fence for? It is designed to inflict limited pain on that horse so that their spirit does not take over and cause them to go beyond the barrier. 
because the barrier to that horse was protecting them from running out in the street and some sap like me running over them and killing them. It's for their own protection. They don't understand that. But that's what it is. And those horses knew well enough to know you hit that fence one time, you don't need too many more times before you just don't go near that fence ever again. Horses know that. There's ways to train dogs where they put a collar on them that gives them a little jolt. It does not kill them. It is not cruel to them. It is meant to teach that dog that there are barriers. And once you teach them that, you turn the power off to that necklace that they have on because you don't need it anymore. You can't, you can hang dead meat on the other side of that barrier and they won't come near it. Because they know they've been trained. The Bible teaches us to train our children. Not abuse them. To train them. You inflict a limited amount of pain in the right area. And in doing so, you teach them to stay away from certain things in life. There are barriers that every human being needs to understand and know. Am I right? Yeah. Barriers. Using a switch, belt, a rod is biblical. Use it in the right way, in the right fashion, at the right time, and you train that child. You teach them there is painful consequences for wrong actions. But of course we live in a world now where nothing's wrong anymore. Everything's okay. Do whatever you want. That's Satanism, by the way. Aleister Crowley, one of the most wicked Satanists ever lived in our time. His motto was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That is in direct contradiction to God's law that said, Thou shalt not. Somebody say amen. The world wants you to think and they want your children to think that whatever they feel like doing, whatever they want to do is okay for them to do. And there's no consequences for that. God says, yes, there is. The consequences for that is hell. And I want you to ponder that this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And I want you, let's pick it up in verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger. And shall burn unto the lowest hell. And shall consume the earth with her increase. And set on fire the foundations of of the mountains. God in his word said that the lowest hell is on fire. Do you believe God's word this morning? So this morning, we we'll to pick it up where we left it off last week. We're going to touch on the experience of hell. This is doctrinal teaching. I'm preaching a little bit. I'm preaching to lost people. I'm preaching in hopes that somebody would be saved or a backslider would come back from the field of sin that they're in and come back to righteousness, come back to wanting to live right, come back to still being afraid that they could go to hell. See, I got to a, an age... When I was still living with my mom and dad, that I thought that they couldn't whip me no more. Guess what my mom did? She whipped me some more. My mom was only doing what God told her to do. Because I can tell you, if you gave me a choice between my mama's whipping and God's whipping, I'd take mom's. God's whipping 
I'm very afraid of. But I also know there are times when I need it. And just between me and you, there is times when I've told God, God, you need to whip me for that. God, you need to chastise me. Don't, God, don't let me get away with stuff like that. God, don't let me, don't let me get outside the boundary. I don't like that. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to teach you about hell. We're going to straighten some people's brains out about what hell is and what hell isn't. Heavenly Father, we ask for your grace, your blessings. We ask for your mercy, your help. And Father, we ask God, it's not easy, Lord, for us to say this. But God, if, if any of us has gotten out of line, walked away, Lord, from your statutes and your commandments, done those things that you told us not to do. God, we ask you to chastise us. Father, we're telling you, Lord, as we learned in Hebrews 12, we're telling you, God, that we're not going to despise the chastening of our Father, that we'll take it. Because taking your chastisement is far better than the sorrows and the pains of hell for eternity. Because God, you're angry but for a moment. And then you're full of love and compassion. And God, your chastening only lasts for a season. But your righteousness and love lasts forever. So Father, teach us, Lord, to be afraid. To be very, very afraid of hell. Father, teach us this Bible straight, gun barrel straight. Teach us, Father, that, that your word is right in everything that it says. And God, you don't lie. You don't mince words. You don't hide things. You don't mean to say something and then say something else. God, what your Bible says, it says. And Father, help us, dear God. Give us knowledge. Give us understanding. And by it, give us wisdom. Father, Lord, help, use this to help somebody, Lord, who's maybe been taught something else about hell that ain't true. And God, just teach us your right ways. Chastise us, Lord, if we need it. We're very, Lord, Father, we're very rebellious and we're very corrupt. Teach your children your ways, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. As I said earlier, I started on this last week. Let me read these verses to you. We touched on these. I'm going to kind of read these and then I'm going to move on. 2 Samuel 22, 6. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Hell. Now watch this now. By this one verse, I could preach this one verse and prove to you that hell is more than just you being buried in the ground and having no consciousness whatsoever, which is what some people teach. There's, there's teachings going around that says that once you close your eyes, you're dead, you have no knowledge of anything, it's over with, you're unconscious, you're asleep, you're dead, <clears throat> you don't know anything, don't think anything, don't experience anything, nothing. Nothing. You just, you just turn into obliteration. You are annihilated and it's over with. Let me tell you something. If I truly believe that hell was that way, I would have a whiskey bottle in this hand and a whiskey bottle in this hand. My arms would embrace the sins and the pleasures of this world. And I would not be in God's house on Sunday morning. I would not be standing here with the Word of God. I would not be behind a pulpit preaching to you. I would not be trying to teach you about God's love and God's mercy for your sins. I would be out there experiencing what everybody else is experiencing out there. Because then at the end of my life, I just die. And I don't know anything. And I don't experience anything. And I'm just obliterated. 
separated and who cares? What I'm telling you is, if that's all that was after this life, there's no need for any of us to come to church ever again. How can you preach the love and the mercy of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary atonement for your sins when there is no punishment for your sins? That's like trying to teach children that some things that they do are wrong without punishing them for doing what they were told not to do. There has to be punishment. It's just like the police... Catching the murderers and saying to them, murder is bad. You're free to go. There has to be punishment. Amen? And the liberal lawyers of this nation have succeeded in making American jails the most comfortable places that a criminal can live in. And I think that criminals ought to be punished for things they did wrong. Can I hear you say it? It's the only way to save them. Because we have in the American prison system what's called, I'm going to say this, recid recidivism? Yeah, what he said. You know what that means? They commit the crime. Do a little time, go back out, commit another crime, come back in, do some time, go back out, commit some crimes, come back in. They just keep doing it. You know why? It's not punishing them. It doesn't hurt them to do the time. They haven't learned anything. They haven't been corrected because there's no punishment to it. The sorrows, this verse alone would tell you that when you die, you experience your death. Sorrow is an emotion. It is part of our heart. It's part of our soul. The sorrows of hell can pass me about. What that means is, is that when you are in hell, you are finally sorry for what you did. That's what my mom knew when I was saying to her, Mom, I am sorry. That I did this. She didn't believe me. She knew not to accept that from me. She knew to go ahead and continue with the whipping, the punishment, the torture chamber. She knew to continue on with it. Because I can say I'm sorry. We had a, we had a family that they went to another church and they brought their children to our school. Their church told them that if your child confesses they're wrong to you and says they're sorry, you should not give them punishment after that. Because after all, we as Christians, we say we're sorry to God all the time. And we're forgiven, so they should be forgiven. That doesn't work. Because what do kids figure out pretty quickly? John, what do they figure out? How to get Matthew? What was you going to say? They're going to cry big crocodile tears and say, "I'm sorry, oh mother, please forgive me in Jesus' name." And they're going to go right back out and do it again. Psalm one sixteen three: The sorrows of death can pass me; the pains of hell get hold upon me. Pains of hell. Pain. Torture. Matthew 5, 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. And if the right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the, thy whole body should be cast into hell. Whole body. All of eternity. In pain. Mark 9.46 Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. 
It says it again in Mark 9.44, Mark 9, uh, Mark 9.48. By the way, verse 46, 44, uh, let's see here. And I think part of 45, those verses are missing out of the NIV and the New American Standard and the Holman Standard, the Message Bible and all those. They've taken them out, Jody. Took them out of the Bible. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. The worm that it's speaking of here is your soul. Now I have a teaching on that. It's, it's been years since I've done it, but I may bring it back up just to get you to understand, give you the understanding that the worm being spoken of here is your soul. And if you think that after your body quits breathing, that that is the end of your conscious being, you're wrong. You're wrong. You are a living dead person. The experience of hell. In fact, turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Look at some of these other verses. Revelation 20. You might want to turn there. Luke 16. You might want to open your Bible up there. I ask. There's a man that follows our ministry. Been about seven years now he's been following us. He came out of the Seventh-day Adventist cult. I'm not nice about it. Number one, they teach a false gospel. They teach that by, by going to church on the Sabbath, that is the, that is the true sign that you're born again. It is a works-based salvation. Number two, I, I, I am in full opposition to them because their doctrine does not come from the Bible. It comes from the dreams and visions of Ellen White who received them from a familiar spirit. Number three, their doctrine on hell is wrong and unbiblical. So I asked him, I said, what is the, what is the Seventh-day Adventist idea and concept of hell? And he gave me some, some ideas, some things to look at. And I looked them up and I'm going to show you something this morning. Dangerous wolves will always be spotted by their doctrine of hell. You can always spot them. By what they think hell is. Matthew 13 verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels. And they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend. And them which do iniquity. Now I'm going to stop right here for a minute. And I'm going to ask in this room. Who in here has ever offended the law of God to raise your hand? That's you. You are worthy. To go to hell and nothing else. Don't ever forget it. In case we start boasting about who we are versus what everybody else is. I hate that. I used to do that. Still, to this day, struggle with it a little bit. I like to puff myself up and abase everybody else. And I'm good at it. In fact, I think I'm better than you are at it. But that used to be me and my nature. Was make myself big and righteous and holy. While I, while I denounced everybody else. Forgetting and realizing. That I was also worthy of hell fire for all of eternity. Just like everybody else was. So when that one thing right there. I'm not any different than anybody else in this world. I offended the law of God. I have done iniquity multiple times. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels. They shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend. And them which do iniquity. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. They ever ask you, have you ever been to a doctor's office, surgeon's office, somebody's office, and they ever said, on a, pain of, on a scale of 1 to 10, where is your pain? Who in here has ever had what they believe to be a number 10 pain time? On God's scale, your number 10 pain was Point zero 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 one percent of God's version of it. The human body 
has a system by which it can tolerate extreme pain for so long and then it shuts down. It's called shock. You just kind of flip out. You don't know what's going on. In hell, there's no shock. You're going to have to deal with it. Wailing and gnashing of teeth that never ends. Luke 16, 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that I may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Hell is torment. If you uh, get our Bible search software, there's a Webster's Dictionary built into it. You can type in the word torment or you can click the word torment in this verse and find out the, def the Bible definition of the word torment. The Webster's Dictionary, 1828, uses King James Bible verses in describing what the words mean. I like it. Amen? You find out what torment. Torment means the absolute utmost of all pain that anybody can ever feel. That's what you're going to experience. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. How long? Day and night, forever and ever. From these three verses, do you see any place that indicates to you that hell is the grave and it's annihilation and once you go there, you just cease to function, you cease to know anything, and it's over and done with. No. It goes forever. Just like heaven goes forever, hell goes forever. And there's no end to it. Job's Witness. Watchtower, Bible, and Tract Society are dangerous wolves. I, and I want you to think about this for a minute. Let's say that, John, let's say you're the devil. I'm sure some people may have thought that about you a time or two. And your job is to try to convince people that they don't need the cross. They don't need the gospel. They don't need salvation. They don't need to be born again of incorruptible seed by the word of God which liveth in by the forever. Your job is to keep people out of the faith. To get them, get them out of church. Okay? Or get them in church where they're not going to preach the cross. That's your job. Your job is to convince people that they don't need the cross and salvation. How do you do it? You're the devil. Here's one way you do it. I'll help you out. Take away the punishment. Take away the punishment. If you can convince people, religious people, that at the end of their life, that if they don't make it to heaven, that they just rot away in the grave, and they're completely annihilated. That they have no consciousness. And that there is no eternal, everlasting, day-to-day, -day, torturous, tormented punishment for your sins. If you teach people that and convince them of that, then, Miss Linda, it just stands to reason then that they won't need the cross of Jesus Christ. They won't need Jesus. They won't need salvation. They won't need the gospel. They won't need the Bible. They won't need churches. They won't need to confess their sins. Right? Seventh day. Charles Taze Russell started the Jehovah's Witness cult specifically because he did not like the church's teaching on hell. It bothered him. So here's their doctrine. Death is considered a state of non-existence. Watchtower Publications teach that hell is not a place of fiery torment, but rather the common grave of mankind. A place of unconscious non-existence. 
Gehenna, the Bible word commonly translated hellfire, is said to describe a judgment of complete destruction from which the resurrection is not possible. They reason that complete destruction does not allow for literal torture of the wicked as the deceased person is not conscious. Based on this, they believe that parables such as that of the rich man and Lazarus should not be interpreted literally and that such references are speaking of symbolic death and not the physical death of actual individuals. In other words, once you die, that's it. And I'm going, that's the devil. To try to convince me that at the end of my life, I received no punishment for the things that I've done wrong. Let me tell you something. That's not fair. It's not fair to me, and it's not fair to everybody else. Because I know some people who have done some terrible things that if they don't get saved, they're going to get the justice that they deserve. Dangerous wolves. Dangerous wolves. Seventh-day Adventist church. Don't join them. Don't listen to their YouTube videos. Don't read their, their newsletters. Don't read their books. Don't invite them over. Don't go to their prophecy studies. They're big on prophecy. Don't entertain them for a minute. They're dangerous. This is from their website. They, it's called the unconscious nothingness of death. Separates us from the God of life, yet Jesus' defeat of death means the saved can look forward to resurrection and living forever. The wages of sin is death, but God who alone is immortal will grant eternal life to his redeemed. Until that day, death is an unconscious state for all people. When Christ, who is our life, appears, the resurrected righteous and the living righteous will be glorified and caught up to meet their Lord. The second resurrection, the resurrection of the unrighteous, will take place a thousand years later. And they give, my thing is, when they give all these little Bible verse listings without listing the verse, something's up. That means the verse doesn't say what they just said, but they don't think that you'll read it. And then they have an article that says dead men can't save you. Listen to this. Once you're dead, you can't interact with anyone who's still alive. Now somebody tell me why that's wrong. Once you're dead, you cannot interact with anybody that's alive. Somebody tell me why that's wrong. Yes, Caleb. Now you're missing it. It's a good try, but you're missing it. Abraham was alive in a place called Abraham's bosom. When the rich man died, he talked to Abraham. Luke 6. In fact, there it is. Turn your Bible Luke 16. Luke 16. And the, there was one time that the Jehovah's Witness came to my door. And I brought up Luke 16 to them. And they said, well, that was a parable. That didn't really happen. And it doesn't really mean that. They stood on my porch, Phil, and they called God a liar. That doesn't go over well with me. Don't get into a conversation with them. Push them off of your porch. Literally. Do not bid them Godspeed. Separate yourselves from them. And give them place by subjection. No, not for a moment. That's what Paul said he does with them. Don't invite them over for dinner. Don't have any conversation with them. Because for the most part, they are men of corrupt minds. Now, every now and then, you get a Brady Crumb out of, the, out of the gang. Amen? But my overall time with them is that they're not going to listen to you. They've been so indoctrinated with their nonsense, they're not going to listen to you. And they literally will point to Luke 16 and say, God did not really mean that. 
it means something else other than what it says. I'm one of these where if you read it in the Bible, it means exactly what God said it means. Somebody say amen. amen. Luke 16, verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. That does not sound like an unconscious grip. That does not sound like the dead guy in the casket. Be, you know, we pretend that these people in the casket can hear us, but really, really we know they can't, right? That's just their body. Their soul is in one place or the other. And in this case, he was in hell. Lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Now, look up at me. The... The wrong place to ask for mercy is in hell. The right place to ask for mercy is right here, right now, while God offers it to you. <coughs> Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Lazarus did not read your best life now. The rich man did. What does that tell you about Joel Osteen and his gospel? I'd be interested. I would be really interested... In hearing what Joel Osteen says about hell, the problem is he never talks about it. In understanding this and looking into it, I found out some what's what I call dangerous ideologies. Number one, annihilationism. Annihilationism is the Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, Jehovah's Witness doctrine, and it's creeping into churches. It basically says that once you die and you're lost, there is no conscious knowing of anything. You are completely and totally annihilated and simply cease to exist. Again, I'm just telling you my own wicked nature in that if I really believed that, I would not be here today. I'd be out with some people you know. Or with you. But I would not be in church today. The reason why I still try to live what I'm supposed to live is because I don't believe that you cease to exist the moment you die. The whole message that Bethel Church should try to send out to this world is there is something awaiting you after you die. You are going to have to choose which side you want to live in. Heaven or hell. Soul mortality. Basically means that your soul can die just like your body can die. And once it does, it ceases to exist. Or it's called conditional immortality. It is. It says that if you are saved, then you will live forever and be immortal. But if you are lost, you do not have a resurrected body and, and, and you do not live in a state of knowing or being. You simply cease to exist. Soul sleep is another one of those. The very second that the rich man died, immediately he lift up his eyes being in torment. Now his body is still in the grave, wherever it is. But 2,000 years later, that rich man's soul is still weeping and wailing and gnashing his teeth and wanting that drop of water on his tongue. And he never got it fulfilled. These are dangerous ideologies. Are these, now say, that's Seventh-day Adventist Church, and that's the Jehovah's Witness cult, and bless God, we don't have to worry about that moving into our churches, do we? Remember I told you, let me, in fact, let me show you this. Remember that from last week? The word hell is mentioned 54 times in the King James Bible. 
It is only mentioned 32 times in the New King James Bible. You know what they replaced it with? The grave. It's only mentioned 13 times in the NIV. No Old Testament occurrences of the word hell exist in the New International Version of the Bible. Here's what they say. 2 Samuel 22, 6. The King James says the sorrows of hell. The NIV says the cords of the grave. What's been removed? Sorrow. Job 11, 8. The King James says deeper than hell. The NIV says deeper than the depths below. They softened it. They took it out. Psalm 917, the King James says, The wicked are turned into hell. Psalm 917, the NIV, the wicked go down to the realm of the dead. I guess that also means that saved people are wicked too because they also go down to the realm of the dead. Do they not? Psalm 1610. Psalm 1610 really gets me angry because it's a prophecy of Jesus. The King James says, Thou will not leave my soul in hell. So in the NIV it says, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Psalm 116.3 The pains of hell get hold upon me. That's King James. The NIV says, The anguish of the grave came over me. Isaiah 14.15 Isaiah 14, 12, 13 and 14 is about Lucifer. Where's Lucifer going when he is judged? For a thousand years. But then where's he going after that? Lake of fire burning with brimstone, right? Not according to the NIV. Isaiah 14, 15, the King James says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. But the NIV says, But you are brought down to the realm of the dead. It's not the same, people. I try to go and visit... My dad at the cemetery, knowing that his body is there in that ground, but his soul is not. I go and visit the place where we laid our granddaughter, knowing that her body is in that ground, but her soul, thank God, is not. telling you. I'm going to finish it with this. Hell is everlasting, never ending. Proverbs 15 hell. 15 hell. 1511. I got hell on the brain this morning. There's one for the blooper reel. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Deuteronomy 32, 24. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. Psalm 91, 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Proverbs 27, 20. Hell and destruction are never full. Matthew 25, 46. These shall go away into everlasting punishment. This is why it's right to take your children. Here we go. And your grandchildren. And whoop the daylights out of them. Amen, Bemos? Amen. I heard that. Isaiah 33. In fact... Turn your Bible to Isaiah 66. I'm going to show you something. Isaiah 33, 13. Hear ye, uh, hear ye that are far off what I have done, and ye that are near acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Burnings are ever... Listen. The, the fire in the lake of fire will never go out. You see, here's what we're used to seeing. This week we were camping, and so we built a campfire. 
And I'd build it. Boy, I like them big. And roast marshmallows and roast hot dogs and do all that campfire stuff. Next morning I'd get up. Fire's gone. You know why? The wood was all burned up. The soul of man is eternal. Therefore, the fire that burns that soul is eternal. It never goes out. Isaiah 66. The Bible is teaching us. Now, I'm going to read this to you in love and in caution. I want you to understand that when we get to heaven, we will feel and see differently than we do now. I have family members that are in hell. And in some cases, it bothers me to think that way. But according to Isaiah 66, I will see them in the lake of fire. Isaiah 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. What does it mean their carcasses? At the end of the 1,000 years that Christ is going to reign, God is going to call forth the soul and the body of every wicked transgressor that's ever lived. He is going to resurrect them from the grave. They're going to receive a new resurrected body. That new body will be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. And according to this, you and I are going to see them there. Now remember, we're not going to feel and see the way that we do now. When we see people there in that lake of fire, it will be, as far as what I can think of, it will be an everlasting reminder of why we got saved to begin with. Daniel 12, 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. One more verse. Turn to Revelation 14, and I'm done. Revelation 14, and then I'm going to let you go. Who needs to know this stuff? <clears throat> Next week, unless God changes it, I'm going to preach on who goes. Who's going to hell? Revelation 14, 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented. Are you looking at this? He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And here's what the Bible is telling you. Number one, they are tormented for all of eternity. Forever and and forever. Number two, while you and I who are saved are sent into a land of eternal rest, 
You know what that means? No more getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to work. You know what Lisa and I did all last week? Slept in. And yesterday morning and this morning, it was the hardest thing in the world to get up out of bed. I had to get up this morning and go to work. When I get to heaven, no more. I'll get rest. But those who are in hell, no rest. I told you, I think last week, they gave me a shot in my back a few months ago, and it hurt. It was a 10 pain. And the only way that I got through it was I took these muscle relaxers that literally make me pass out in sleep. And I slept through the pain. I got rest. Chemically induced rest. But I got rest. In hell, there is no rest. They are in torment. And it never stops. And you have family members that are going there right now. They need to be warned. The rich man, when he found out that Abraham could not send Lazarus with water, asked that he send Lazarus back from the dead to warn his brothers of the place that he was in. You know what Abraham said? They have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Let's warn people from here of where they're going. Telling them that you were no better than they were and you were going to. But for Jesus Christ who saved you. You shouldn't want people to die and go to hell. But they will. At least give them one chance to turn and be saved. The same chance that God gave you. Let's bow our heads. I want you to ponder what's been said. I want you to think about yourself, and I want you to think about somebody you know. Maybe your neighbor is going to hell. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't want them to go. Maybe you have family members. Maybe you have children grandchildren, aunts, uncles, cousins. I have an aunt who is a Christadelphian. She is, that's a branch of Jehovah's Witness. She does not believe in hell. I've often prayed about what to say to her or how to say it. And the words never come. But I love her. And I don't want her to go to hell. I want God to save her. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. And Lord, up here on this pulpit, I'm big on talk. And when it comes to being one-on-one -on -one with people, I'm not so good. So God, I can't come down on everybody else for not doing what I'm not doing. It wouldn't be right. The fact is, God, that we all know somebody that's lost like we used to be. And this is where they're going. And we can shut it out of our mind. That doesn't make it go away.
Father, one time you gave me, in my mind's eye, a picture of someone in hell. And it bothered me so bad that I ended up going to that person and telling them that. And they didn't accept it right then. But Lord, I know for a fact that today that very person is in heaven with you right now. Lord, give us, give us a vision. People that we know and love in the flames of the lake of fire. And cause us to weep, Lord, over family members and loved ones and friends and neighbors and co-workers who are on their way to hell. And then, Father, give us the words to say because we don't know what to say. Let your Spirit guide us and lead us, but, Father, give us a burden for them and love them first. It's not us who is condemning them. They're condemned of themselves. So, Father, give us a vision of people that we love. And help us, dear God, to reach them with the truth of the gospel. Because of the truth of hell. Bless your word, we pray. In Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please?